Hi, this is Dustin Toms, and welcome to Connect, our uh, monthly podcast featuring interviews one-on-one with uh, movers and shakers in the industry. Today, I'm really excited. We have a, an old friend of the California NBA here, uh, Mary Ludgan, who's uh, been with Heitman for a long time and been actually, I feel like, with the California NBA for a long time. She's been a, uh, a featured speaker at our Western States Craft Conference for a long time, at least as long as I can remember, and always a highlight of the conference. So I'm really excited. We're actually on site at the uh, Western States Craft right now, and so I'm really excited to uh, talk with Mary and find out what her thoughts are on the economy and more. Uh, so before we get started, though, I want to uh, thank our sponsors at uh, the Real Estate Services Trust, or REST. So as an employer in the real estate services industry, I'm sure you feel constant pressure to remain competitive against other firms looking to lure seasoned employees away. If you don't, then you're missing something. If, uh, if so, then we have the perfect solution through the California MBA and Marshall McLennan uh, Agency, a nationwide top leading brokerage firm. You can access the Real Estate Services Trust. It's members only. So once you join the California MBA, you're eligible to uh, access the uh, Real Estate Services Trust. It's a benefits program which provides real estate services industry employers competitive benefit plan options at affordable rates. So the great thing is if you're a smaller company, say 20, 40, 60, 80 employees, you can access big company benefits at reasonable prices and remain competitive, keep your employees. And uh, so if you're interested, uh, click the link below and uh, find out if your company is eligible today. So Mary, super excited to uh, chat with you here. Let me grab my questions here. So the first question I always like to do is uh, sort of get back into, uh, um, sort of go away from the industry for a second and get into your backstory. Find out, you know, what uh, got you into the industry, what got you to Heitman, you know, what brought you to this point? Okay. It's a bit of a checkered path. Uh, I have, uh, I taught five-year-olds, when you major in political science, Mm -hmm. the road is not going to be straight. So I I taught five-year-olds for a while, I was a camp counselor before that. Uh, I worked in the industry, sort of, I worked for an accounting firm, but without any skills in accounting, and that sent me back to graduate school. Mm -hmm. I went back to political science, which is what I majored in uh, as an undergrad, uh, and uh, through a long path we won't go down. And I ended up being focused on urban politics and public policy. Cities were, the northern Rust Belt cities were drowning in debt, close to bankruptcy in the case of New York City and other places. And economic development was about real estate development. So real estate became a focus of what I did. I finished my dissertation, I went to work for the city of Chicago as an urban planner for a couple of years. And then when my mayor died, Uh, it was time to go do something else. And I got lured away by then the second largest grocery store chain in Chicago, now gone. I'm not the reason it died, but um, out of business now in the grocery wars that have happened over the last 15 years. Um, And from there, I went on to a precursor to Heitman, a company called JMB Institutional. They merged with Heitman, and I've stayed at Heitman. So collectively, between JMB and Heitman, it's 30 years. Wow. It, you don't have to see that uh, these days or someone stays at the company that long. I know I've been at the California MBA for 15 years now, and everyone in my generation thinks that's you know crazy. How in the world have you stayed there that long? Yeah. And so, yeah, but it's funny. My, uh, uh, my background, my dad has been at his company for 30 years, and my grandfather's you know worked at his job for 30-plus years. So in my world, it's totally normal. So when I meet somebody else who has yeah. that experience, I'm like, well, that makes sense, you know, of course. Well, but, and for both of us, our jobs have evolved over time, although I've been 100%. involved in research from the beginning. Beginning, we went from being focused on North America only to adding in Europe, and now we invest in Asia, and our clients are all over the world. So my job has evolved, totally evolved. keeping me interested every day. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's you mention the uh, sort of the global perspective. Let's start with the big picture. Um, uh, so yeah. where are we at in the economy right <laughs> now? I mean, there's you could you know go a lot of different directions. I mean, there's a lot of talk about rates. The uh, stock market's been in the news. I mean, obviously, you've got China and Brexit just, I mean, the last couple of days has been in the news again. But, you know, unemployment is still pretty low. So there's, you know, yeah. tension, but there's also good news still. So what, what are your thoughts? Well, so when did you last see a 10-year treasury at 147 or wherever it ended? I, had, I didn't look today. I was on a plane. So quite remarkable. Uh, there are elements of the economy that are really strong. The labor market's in really good shape. I read one commentator that said the U.S. consumer is the last thing standing between the globe and recession. Uh, so it's all a matter of what 
what will happen from a labor market perspective. Will employers keep hiring the way we have, which has caused uh, consumers to finally get real income gains? Uh, for years, they, their income gains weren't keeping up with inflation, even though inflation has been modest. So the consumers finally, over the last three years or so, had real income gains and is spending that. And we're a consumption-oriented society. That being said, so that's the positive. The negative is, as you mentioned, we've got a global trade war underway. It is said regularly nobody wins a trade war. Uh, and there are those that are seeing weakness in China that results from this. Certainly that appears to be the case. There are other issues the Chinese economy is facing as well beyond tariffs. But the U.S. consumer, if you add together the effect of all the tariffs, it's about $1,000 per household tax accumulated right now. So that is nothing yeah, to sneeze at. For sure. So our view as a firm is that we are closer to recession than ever before in this 10-year-long expansion. Not that we're in it tomorrow. The index of leading indicators remains positive, among other uh, um, forward-looking things. But we are vulnerable to a shock of some sort. And often those shocks come out of nowhere and often they're about a change in business sentiment. And business sentiment is negative right now. The, the PMI for manufacturing went negative uh, this past month for the first time in uh, since 2016. Not a good sign. And we're coming up on an election year too, which you know, who knows what that does with uh, you know, uh, business, you know, uh, outlook for the next year going yes. forward. I mean, that's a huge question mark. Usually in the past, politicians have done what they could to try to get the economy into the best shape possible. Uh, I think Trump's plan is to try to get some sort of deal with China that would improve relationships. Who We, we certainly don't want to... to uh, to, to live with intellectual theft, intellectual property theft, and other things that, that are behind Trump's trade war. Uh, that being said, trade wars often have unexpected consequences. Sure, yeah. And there have been, obviously, the retaliatory tariffs. Already, yeah. Already. And uh, we have such an interconnected world now that even looking at trade wars 15 or 20 years ago isn't really pertinent because we are so much more interconnected as a globe. Does that make it harder on the research side to, you know, is it to the point where it's apples and oranges or is it still just kind of maybe different flavors of apple? I think different flavors of apple, uh, but uh, for sure uh, to look at the U.S. flows in and out of Mexico and Canada, right, car parts are going back and forth across borders and resulting in a car that's a combination of Canadian and U.S. or Mexican and U.S., right? So uh, it's a complex business, and I'm not sure, to get a little political, I'm not sure Mr. Trump fully understands the complex business. Not as simple as you know, not as made simple. in the USA. or a a yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So then what, uh, of the, all these factors, what would uh, what worries you more? China or, I mean, you haven't really got, uh, touched on Brexit yet, but I mean, is, I mean, that was just mm. in the news the last couple of days. Sure. Uh, it sounds like the prime minister there is, you know, you know, fighting some headwinds, to say the least. That he is, uh, and I am by no means an expert. I read a paragraph or two on Brexit and have to read it again because the system is so so different from ours, a parliamentary system. I'm not yeah. familiar with uh, the nuances of it. But for sure, you've got – we're moving from a setting – three years or so ago when there was a synchronized global expansion to one where there are threats to Europe's viability economically. Italy is already weak. Germany, Germany's been a victim of the trade war with between the U.S. and China, among other dynamics. So the German economy has had at least one uh, negative GDP quarter, maybe two, and I just haven't kept up. So Europe is weak. And a, a hard Brexit, which is what Johnson seems to be going for, is sh is a shock to that system that's had seamless flows of trade for how many years? 30 years, Quite a while. roughly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's risk there, uh, and that creates headwinds for the U.S. Uh, they buy things. We're not a giant export nation, but we they, we export a lot of intellectual capital. We do export some things to Europe. We don't want them. Uh, in negative territory, and you have other trading locations globally, like Singapore, that they had a negative quarter of GDP in the second quarter. So there's there's global risk right now. 
So yeah. that's on my mind. A little more than China. China's more in the background as our a factor. All right. So looking at more uh, local here for us on the West Coast, uh, you know, what's the state of the real estate market out here? I know that's going to be the topic of your uh, uh, talk tomorrow. Yeah. But uh, give us a little preview. What uh, trends are you keeping an eye on in particular? Well, certainly the Western region is giant and varied. But you broadly have been experiencing some really positive population dynamics. Uh, cities like Denver getting people to, to move to Denver without a job. Uh, that happened in the Mork and Mindy era of the late 1970s. And then um, Denver was a less viable economic location now. And it, it's, it certainly uh, suited millennials. Uh, who are looking for places to live where they can actually buy a house and other things. So among the western region uh, locations, Denver is a real bright spot. You have very tight uh, markets in many locations. Downtown San Francisco office, extremely tight with limited amounts of supply because of Prop M as one example. Um, you've got really tight industrial markets across most of the region. Industrial is the darling property type right now. Uh, and year after year, the Inland Empire delivering not double digit rent growth anymore, but high single digits, remarkable, never seen it in my life before. A couple things you wrestle with on the negative side, the wildfires last summer uh, have brought to mind uh, issues that other parts of the globe are experiencing as well, just different in the, obviously in the um, eastern part of the United States and parts of Europe, there's regular flooding. Yours is a lack of water. We have water, but in the wrong places globally. We could use now. some out here. You could use some here. And that could be a curb on this remarkable population growth that's been going on. Uh, and we got to look at urban planning and figure out it, it, with wildfires as an ever greater threat. Are we designing cities in a smart way? And smart growth broadly, how to handle growing in a, in a, a prudent way. Yeah, all right. Um, so, uh, you know, let me see here, I think we already have passed that one. Okay, so where are we at with uh, uh, opportunity zones? Um, are they meeting expectations? I just read a good article about this the other day. What are your, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, are they driving positive change from uh, what you can tell? I'm a bit of a skeptic on opportunity zones. If you look at them, mind you, every state government, I believe it was the governors, the governor's offices, submitted the opportunity zones within their state. So their opportunity zones in all 50 states and thought they were done, we hope, thoughtfully. But in a lot of instances, they're big enough that they encompass areas that don't need any help, that were already on their way, as well as areas that really do need the help. My sense is that uh, real estate developers are smart. They're going to go to the places that are the least risky. Uh, and so I think it means it's been less effective than you'd like it to be. Uh, noble intent uh, and has some bipartisan support for it. Execution, a little problematic. And from a research perspective, anytime supply is being produced by some reason other than complete supply and demand, there's a risk that it then beggars its neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a risk that you've got perhaps an abundance of supply. We saw this in the 80s with tax-oriented syndications and real estate was being developed not because there was true occupier demand for it, but because there was somebody to buy it at the back end. And that ended up skewing the markets and resulted in a terrible downturn in real estate in the early 90s with that recession. Not to go negative on you, but I, I think there are going to be some unintended consequences to this program. Yeah, well, I mean, that's you could say that about a lot of government programs. To you sure could. Um, so uh, what about the uh, retail space? Uh, we haven't talked about that yet. So where do you see uh, retail in, you know, say maybe a little further out, like two years, five years? Yeah, nice. I mean, is are we looking at, uh, you know, where's the, where does Amazon fit in that picture? Are they helping, hurting? Are they mm -hmm. going to destroy the retail space? I mean, will there be viable retail space in five, ten years? Uh, there will. Uh, and I say that in part because of the behavior of Amazon. Amazon bought Whole Foods to have, uh, to be in the grocery business, to have a means of getting goods to people more easily. Stores have been the means to do that historically. 
e-commerce got in the way of that. And then what happens? The very first e-commerce retailer opens stores, not just Whole Foods buying Whole Foods, but opening Amazon Go and looking at other formats. It's a clue about this interconnectedness. I've got my phone with me because I always have my phone with me, right? Oh, here, here's the lovely Anais, the boy dog with the girl name. Uh, the phone is going to continue to be a means for us to access goods. So is the computer. So is something else I haven't thought of yet. So is your iPad. But stores are an increasingly regular component of how formerly clicks only retailers met their consumers. And I'll talk about this more in more depth tomorrow, but it's in part because the costs of free shipping or reduced cost shipping and free returns eat into profits. E mm. E-commerce startups, pretty inexpensive, right? Sometimes you can even get away with not having inventory other than an on-demand situation. But over time, getting that next incremental customer, that costs. And once upon a time, <clears throat> online advertising was cheap because it was novel and new. And there's a J-curve now in the cost of it. So you've got online-only retailers. First of all, none of them is profitable. They're opening stores. They're not opening a lot of stores. I don't want to distort this. But they are opening stores as a statement that physical retail has a role in uh, how retailers serve their customers. So I like that you looked at two to five years because we've got an ugly period now where you've got a lot of dead men walking kind of shopping centers, mostly in the regional mall space, but by no means exclusively there. It will take a recession to cleanse that, and there will be pain in that cleansing process. But five years from now, three years from now, it'll be completely clear what I've been saying for years, which is there's this bifurcation between those shopping centers of all approaches regional malls, super regional malls, down to box centers and, and grocery anchor centers. There'll be a sorting out between the, the ones that are viable and will have a role going forward and are interesting to people and the ones that don't have a future and will be something else. Yeah, which, I mean, if the market demands, they should be something else. But it's interesting you talk about uh, with uh, Amazon and, and uh, free returns and free shipping. I mean, good for the consumer, obviously. Yes. They love it. It keeps them around. But, yes. you know, to your point, it eats into profits. It eats into profits, and uh, it turns out stores, they have you have to pay rent, you have to pay employees, but there's an interesting upselling opportunity that stores can offer, uh, among other dynamics. Yeah, well, sometimes it's almost a little more convenient when you just turn your head from one to the other. It's easier than having the suggested product come up on your, you know, on your app that you may ignore. Um, uh, exactly. It turns out, I don't have the full stats on it, but upselling, getting a customer to buy beyond what they expected to buy when they went online versus in a store. Upselling is much easier in a store than it is online. And I think because of the tactile experience or the, the multitude of other reasons that uh, include a salesperson suggesting that uh, you really need this. Yeah, well, as someone who goes to Costco, it seems like far too often, it is very easy to uh, go in there thinking you're going to get you know, one or two things and wind up with a giant shopping cart full as you do. Absolutely. Yeah. You might have been shopping hungry one of those things. Yeah, absolutely. You're told absolutely. never to do. <laughs> that is part of the deal, <laughs> for sure. So uh, um, so what do you say then? What would you say is the, uh, the hottest product right now on the market? Industrial. Absolutely. Industrial. It remains the hottest product. It isn't usually at this point in the cycle, because usually by now, we're 10 years into an economic cycle, none of us has lived through something as long as this. This is the longest it's gone in, in since post-World War II. Um, but usually by this point in the cycle, rents are starting to, rents are still growing, but they're starting to slow. The rate of growth is starting to slow because we've produced more supply in a year than there is demand. That's just begun, but we still are seeing really strong rent growth. Uh, so I think it takes a recession to disrupt the warehouse and distribution space. Uh, and uh, it's still, we're not in recession, so people are still going gangbusters. I just saw the, the announcement of the trade. Blackstone and AEW bought a billion-dollar portfolio of existing value-added assets from TA Realty. Uh, so it remains the hot property type, hard to buy in bulk, uh, and uh, cap rates continue to compress. All right. So I'm curious, so you're in, a, switching gears a little bit, you're in, a, in an industry that historically very male dominated. Um, 
However, that, I mean, I think that just from you know being in our Western states craft here in the last couple of years, especially, I think you've seen that start to really change. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? What what's, what are your you know your uh, if you had advice for uh, younger women just joining the industry, what are your you know so your advice and your your outlook? Well, first of all, I would say we love there to be an abundance of women uh, in this industry. I have loved it. Uh, it has been uh, it's a remarkably uh, interesting sector because no day is ever the same as the day before what confronts you the 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 what will the next recession look like right there's always something interesting that's happening uh, so I would put I would say to anyone that's thinking about it male or female come on in uh, to women in particular women bring things to a meeting we behave differently uh, we are complementary to uh, uh, innovation and creativity and good management and other things so uh, come in it's worth the oddity of being the only one in the room for a period of time you won't be for long yeah, yeah. I would say we have started um, trying to change the complexion of real estate uh, we had an intern uh, come into our program uh, who added some um, she added some diversity. Uh, she came for her summer between sophomore and junior years, and then again junior and senior years, and we've just made her a, a job offer on the premise that she was identified as part of our diversity effort. So um, many women should be aware that there are efforts at promoting diversity uh, and uh, knowing that women bring a voice that's valuable. Absolutely. Well, and again, I mean, just the last couple of years, I think just the change we've seen, just the year-over-year -year change at the Western States prep alone. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a noticeable difference. So, that, I mean, it's really positive to see that and, you know, see that in real time. So, all right. Um, so what about, uh, wh here's an interesting question. So what would you say is the most underreported commercial real estate story uh, this year? Hmm. I'll go with one that is well reported, but maybe people aren't reading. And it relates to climate change and its implications for a sector that's all about location, location, location. Uh, it, a lot of people don't want to deal with it, They'd rather ignore it, uh, but I think you ignore it at your peril. Uh, there are dynamics that I don't fully understand that are playing out right now as Hurricane Dorian pummels the Bahamas yep. that relate to a slowing down of storms, it relates to prevailing winds and other things that uh, it's not my realm. But what's relevant is it creates more storm surge. And so an area that might have just been devastated by winds and initial rain is now flooded. Uh, and that, the, the land area that can be covered by flooding is remarkable. A, a story that I don't think has gotten nearly enough attention, the flooding that took place along the Mississippi and the Missouri uh, mm -hmm. this summer, uh, this spring, uh, which is when the flooding typically happens. There are parts of, I believe it's Alabama and Mississippi, and Mississippi that were at flood stage in the spring that remained there through the summer. That's how bad it is. Uh, so as an industry, we've got to get smart about this and understand the kind of risks that we're taking on when we're looking at investing in a piece of property or backing somebody that's going to invest in a piece of property. The premise that insurance will always be there to bail us out is a flawed one because insurance contracts are typically 12 months and typically they can be rewritten at the end of it or a provider can decide against. So I think that's the story to... That's an interesting angle. I hadn't thought about that. But, well, and so much of, uh, you know, commercial real estate in our country at least are on the two borders. I mean, right uh, where we love gonna, coastal yeah. places, right? It's where people have congregated for centuries, in part because water was a mode of transportation as well as uh, uh, other dynamics. So yes, the Globe's real estate is coastal, yeah. with a few exceptions like Chicago, which has the third coast. So, okay, well, so as we uh, close out our time here, any, uh, you know, how about a tip for uh, lenders to survive the next 12 months where we may or may not see a recession? I mean, it's, this, again, this is the election year coming up. Yeah. I mean, not that really anyone, I mean, if anyone could predict the next 12 months, I mean, 
we're in Vegas right now for the prep, uh, Western Days <laughs> prep. You should be here uh, if you can predict the next <laughs> yes, 12 if months. Yes, you're so. that good. You're that good. But I assuming our, our the flaws in our, our predictive uh, uh, you know powers here, what would you say about uh, you know tips for the next 12 months? Yes, and I've been saying this at the Craft Conference for a couple of years, but to the extent you can diversify your exposure, not just be in a single sector, uh, industrial is the darling now, it will be the darling again after the next recession, but I'm not sure it's going to have a great downturn uh, as there's a lot of speculative construction happening now. Uh, so I would say be pretty sober-minded as you think about risk. Right now, we've entered an area of higher risk. It's not reflected in the, the rate that you can charge either. Uh, we know that rates are not going to stay at this level forever, although uh, the fact that... Longer than we thought. <laughs> it's extended longer than we thought, um, that's for sure. Uh, so I think I'd be focused on um, diversify the borrower exposure that you've got, the type of property exposure that you've got. To the extent you've got choices between metropolitan areas, that would be good. Diversify, diversify, diversify. All right, that sounds great. All right, well, thanks again, Mary. Really appreciate the time. Thanks, thanks for joining thanks us. Thank you, Dustin. Thank yeah. you so. Thank you, Mary. And uh, we'll catch you next time on Connect.